Yeah, like yeah, your, your video feed seems yeah, to seems stop, to just in stop. case you turned it off. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to hope that it hasn't frozen for everyone. And that's cool, man. Cool. I can see you moving. Okay, cool, sweet. Um, so I'm Luke Flegg. I used to go to this school, SANS, in Devon, um, from like 2000 to like 2002. And Sean was teaching then, PE, geography, stuff like that, humanities. Yeah all those things. Um, these are some current students behind me and I just thought it would be nice to um, just try doing a, a video call that's public with the world just to invite anyone interested to ask these guys any questions about SANS. Um, so, um, do you guys want to like give just a word or two why you wanted to join? Just super one super short little sentence, just if you are able to talk. I think Momo, I don't know if you can, but can you talk, Momo? Or are you muted because you're in a, a place you can't speak? Ah. I'll come back. Hi. <laughs> I, um, I was just curious, because I, I only just found out about it through you posting about it. Um, but I'm really interested in alternative schooling and just seeing how younger people feel more empowered when they're in a different kind of environment to say, for example, what I grew up with and what the kind of school that I went to. Um, so it's just really interesting to hear just the thoughts and how you guys think and how you feel about it all. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to tune in. I'm just going to take myself off mute on mute for a minute. Wicked. Right, should we just like quickly skip around you three and then take like a tangible question we can run with, maybe? Just so we have a sense of who's who. Uh, Charles, do you want to go next? Say sure thing. Like it about what your interest is. Sure, um, I, I'm interested in working with democracy myself, and uh, an opportunity to talk to young people. Um, uh, my question is going to be about the environment and stuff like that, and because uh, uh, it's one thing being able to choose for yourselves, but um, I wonder what kind of information you're being given with regards to livestock and climate change and. Uh, all the things that I'm working to try and introduce into curriculums and um, doing just about everything we can to try because it's very difficult to change curriculums. Uh, so I'm interested to find out what you're learning and then you know then you can make choices how that works. Cool. Nice. And Richard, what about you, mate? Um, I'm a primary school teacher in a school for children with social, emotional and mental health issues. Um, I'm very interested in learning about democratic schools. I don't know anything about them. So um, I'd be really interested to know how you guys having power over what happens in your school um, could inform other schools. You know, can, can you uh, give us advice as, as educationists as well in order to benefit kids who are not in democratic schools? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Awesome, and then we've got one or two questions from people. Uh, Danny is um, in a cafe and can't join with a microphone, but we can, if we have time, we'll, we'll come back to his question and maybe one or two others. But yeah, all right, so should we just take one of those? I think, Richard, you had a pretty formed question yeah. there, no? Do you want to yeah. just, just re-ask that question and I'll shut up? Um, okay, from from your experience in a in a democratic school, what advice would you give to education practitioners in non-democratic schools? What advice would you give to oh, teachers God. in other schools oh, if you had like a um, census that you should perhaps consider this or be authentic? Yeah, be I know it's because it sounds a bit lame to say be yourself, but just you know don't. Um, you just got to be real with the kids because they can sense um, BS a mile off. And, uh, you, you know, if you want to have, you know, take each other seriously and have mutual respect and have mm -hmm. good relationships with each other, then the first step is, is just come in as a person and not as a, I'm yeah. going to be your teacher, I am this, I am that, I'm, you know, this is how you have to treat me. Yeah, just be, be yourself and be vulnerable and build a proper relationship. Yeah. One of the first things we did, Richard, when we started SANS was we got rid of all the petty rules. So all the things that get, get, that get in the way of uh, good 
those relationships like so uniforms, first name terms, get rid of the, the rules that make more sense because they create a lot of the conflict. So that would be one thing is get young people to look at the things that cause them distress and feel unfair and unjust. And if you remove that, you've got the maybe the building lots of better relationship. I'll focus on the things that matter then as well. Otherwise you just spend the whole time like I know I I spent more time uh, in like my first year of state school worrying about the fact that my top button of my shirt was pinching my skin or really uncomfortable and that's just totally unnecessary and stupid. Mm. So yeah. Then you come to a school like this, you make some porridge and figure out the sugar's <laughs> actually salt. So no, that's a good one. So isn't it interesting? We've got a school where we've got a school where people can eat when they want. So I read, I read this thing on Facebook which said all the rules that apply to prison apply to school, so you can't go to the toilet without permission. You can't even go sometimes. You can only eat. You can only eat when you're allowed to eat. You can't wear what you want to wear. So there's a whole lot. If you were to describe those rules, it would actually look, it would actually look like prison. How do you if your mind's just filled with being hungry or if you're dehydrated? Or you need, you're really in the toilet. I'm not going to learn anything if Sean's not letting me go to the toilet, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been doing a lot of filming in schools um, and without naming any of them, just like primary and secondary school food is so packed. Oh, it really oh, is like, nice. And I've also, this is going to sound a bit weird, I have also been not exactly in a prison but in a holding cell. Um, <laughs> uh, that'll be. More on that later. Have you got a DVD? I wasn't going. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll um, Yeah, I wasn't. They didn't get me for anything. Um, yeah, they didn't Thanks, Sean. But, but um, yeah, the, the food there, honestly, was pretty much exactly as rubbish as um, in most of the schools that yeah. I film filming. And it's mad, but here it's, it's a lot nicer here, I think. So, yeah. No, I think it highlights a bigger problem, really, or, or a bigger thing, which is a bit like what you were saying about being human and about um, and about being able to exist as people instead of as kind of objects that you need to fill with information and and bad food and um, uh, that you can just kind of get through the the schooling system. So that people can get the grades they want to go on and do. It feels like, um, yeah. I think what what it feels like here is that with a more human environment, you're able to talk to the teachers as people, so that you can then um, really kind of understand and have a relationship that means that you are then able to learn and and not think about what. Tie being done. Yeah, you're you're focusing on learning, learning about the world that you're living in instead of yeah, yeah. So it's like looking at all the things that are unnatural and trying to get rid of them. Use that as your starting point. What's unnatural? What doesn't feel common sense? Get rid of that and then look at what you're left with. Yeah. And you might be left with something that looks a bit more sense. And, and meeting those basic needs before you can get to any sort of higher level of you know, caring about, about you know, cause it's just saying, that whole system is saying that this is more important than your health and happiness. Yeah. So those are not being uh, at all um, the yeah. happiness of the students and their health. Also the teachers as well, like being in an environment where a teacher feels they have to be hostile against a student yeah. because of this, uh, their whole relationship is so volatile. I mean, it's just about mm. as much about the teachers yeah. as it is the students. You've got to make them feel they're able to be feel comfortable to students because that's it's a two-way thing. Just to teach them how it works, really. I guess one thing is like great or something. Um, in a way that I think science can be beneficial is because seeing as you can talk to a teacher you can realise how obtainable it is to um, accomplish something even if you are very far behind at something. Like, let's say if you're terrible at a certain lesson, 
you don't have to feel too worried about um, sort of saying that to a teacher because um, yeah. the communication isn't too bad. And then, like on the flip side, about that, if there are, I guess, new certain students that um, they might be not as good at bringing their ideas across, they might, um, yeah, that might not, that, that sort of um, benefit might not translate over to them as well as for some people. Yeah, yeah. Um, that helps their self esteem and communication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe oh, give so a, yeah. a shout out to noisy people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, is there anyone who needs to leave fairly soon who wants to pop in a question before they run away? Otherwise, I'll randomly select. I gotta try and beat Rush Hour out of London. Uh, okay, Charles, hit us with your question if you don't already have to leave. I'm I'm sorry to to, to do that. I just uh, it sounds like you've gone for ages, and I don't want to stop anything. Um, okay, so um, hi everybody. I'm working with a foundation called the Foundation for Common Good, and we've got this ECAT technology which takes nickel and hydrogen and a catalyst frequency which causes this. There's 150 different theories trying to explain what happens because normal physics can't explain what's happening. But basically, you're left with helium and copper, and a shed load of electrons are released. So it's nuclear synthesis, uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, you go from a lighter to a heavier uh, nuclei, uh, and but we can't really explain how. Anyway, it creates lots of heat, and there's no pollution. And one well, went off in that direction to get all the power uh, and the clean harmonic power is so that we can change the curriculums so that the kids at schools are taught about the connection between livestock and what they eat and climate change um, uh, and the public health crisis. And I guess one, I'm really interested to know, like, are you taught about the connection between livestock and climate change? Like, it's the number one driver of biodiversity loss. It's the number one driver of deforestation. 51% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, according to the World Bank. It's the number one polluter and, and consumer of fresh water. Is that in your curriculum? And uh, if not, do you have any democratic means to like decide what goes in your own curriculum, or are you subject to the national curriculum? And like, what kind of like, what? How can you be like? We want to learn how to work ECATS and the electric model of the universe. We don't want to use the gravitational model of the universe because it's a prison for our minds. Let us be free. You, what's your what degree of freedom have you got with your curriculum? Um, <laughs> and how do you choose? How does it work? I don't know which question to ask. <laughs> Wait, answer. Sorry. Okay, so livestock is livestock in, in the curriculum, and if you wanted to change it, do you, how do you how do you change stuff about your curriculum? Can I answer that? Just say that, that um, sometimes the best bit of the curriculum is outside the class. Yeah. So yeah, this yeah. room you're looking at has become like a debate centre. So only last week we had two hours right through the afternoon talking about the value of veganism and the impact of uh, factory farming on uh, yeah. greenhouse gases. So it, what young people bring, or what I bring is my passion, what Luke would have brought, would be discussed. So you don't need to be in the classroom, you just know that people are open to discuss what's current. Yeah. Yeah. What's probably true is that sometimes, even though something is really powerful and important to the adult, actually the young person doesn't want to hear it then. Yeah. So delivering your curriculum, or even what people want, doesn't mean anyone else wants to hear it. So the best time is to react when there's a passion within the school, and then we, work, and we run with that. Yeah. So the curriculum's everywhere. It's quite a conflicting thing because, of course, we still do GCSEs. Um, we're still aiming for that. We still want to get qualifications, and that is something out of our control. Uh, that curriculum that we need to do. And like Sean said, we do other stuff outside of the curriculum, and here you we you do learn you do learn that, but you also learn to care about it. You, you learn, learn to, have, side, to have the initiative to go and look into that and to care about it and to look beyond look beyond the GCSEs, even though we still do that and we still need to do the curriculum. But um, as for the say that we have in it, I think we do have a lot to say. Um, if we want, you know, like we signed a petition to have the psychology GCSE because we really wanted that, and now we have loads of people doing psychology. And really enjoying that, um, and it, yeah, if it, it was on an extra thing taught, like in S1, S2, we have 
master classes, if there's anything else that the teachers can offer us, or things that we want to go learn outside of school, we, we can do that, we can organise that. And, yes. and we've got a budget to support it, which the yeah. students have got control of. Awesome! <laughs> 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 cool, so we can develop a GCSE and then like, hey guys, you want to do this, you want to learn how to live in symbiosis with all other forms of life, you can be like, hell yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll buy it from Yes, exactly. that. Nice, man. Also, what I would like to say is that because we've got the quite a lot of free time often when you don't do lessons, so that just people find each other and have discussions in the morning in the office or just between lessons or generally sometimes in the older lessons, all the groups lessons it's quite hard because we need to get through the curriculum but especially in the younger groups we just we have the freedom to go off topic and um, talk about stuff that interests us. Also in the weekly meetings there's an example of, I think it links to what you were saying um, like a few weeks ago where uh, the science teacher was talking about um, having like a day in the week where all the food that was cooked for lunch was kind of responsibly sourced um, and that was a whole discussion which kind of brought in all the ethics of veganism and, and vegetarianism and, and the ethics. Yeah, all the food is. Yeah, all the food is. Yeah, it is like locally. Yeah, but we, went and we had like a big discussion that involved the ethics with the idea of maybe having maybe having a day where everything just came from local farms or or, um, or yeah. something about saving yeah. money on the food so that we could then put that towards charity. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. We were asked about that uh, polar bear. Mm -hmm. About Lily and the polar bear. We had a couple of students who went up on the news and they basically made this like life size version of a, a young polar bear and taking it up onto the walls as. Was it, um, <laughs> Protests. Yeah. The climate change. And it was on the BBC. It was very powerful. Thing. And I mean, that was a 13-year-old girl who initiated it all on that. Yeah. On oh, herself. Yeah. So yeah. it was just young people. It was a 13-year-old girl and um, her mum and one of the teachers in the um, in the school kind of organising this event where probably about 150 people came and walked mm -hmm. up on the wall and there were photos of the. BBC spotlight on there and stuff. And, um, it was part of the big thing that um, I think Vars was running or something, which was about climate change. But yeah. At the same time as the Paris climate change conference. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that she went and talked about that and spread the word at the Ashoka conference was yeah. really so, brave. So a great group of students went up and stood in front of 250 big names. Esther Ramsey, I didn't know until I got yeah, John Bird from the Big Issue, and they presented really a story of the school in about one and a half minutes each. And this 13 year old stood up and held centre stage and explained about polar bears and climate change. I think that's so wonderful about him. It's because we have like, um, the freedom of speech to be able to kind of not be afraid to speak to different age groups from younger to older and to be able to have that um, confidence and awareness of yeah. like, you know, what's going on in the world and what people are like. Mm -hmm. And to be able to speak to you, Sean, as a normal person, not as someone who's on a... Yeah, but we all know he's not uh, like he's not an invisible, visible, <laughs> higher level than me. And so <laughs> it's, it's really incredible. Because there are teachers at South Dartmoor, at, at, sorry, um, other mainstream schools, I would say, who the general concept of the school, the teachers are on a higher level to the students, and there's this horrible kind of boarding up of this rebellion, and here you can't really, you can't really rebel, re rebel? Rebel, 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 there's a, cool, there's a cool school in Indonesia called Bali Green School, which our green camp is aligned with, and uh, it's got some cool like um, activism stuff to do. And in Indi Indonesia, they regard the child as the highest example. So you're always working for the children because they're like, the yeah. Yeah. and like, so like, if if you're there and all the teachers are looking up to you, like, dude, like, here's everything we know. Help us figure it out because you're gonna have to take it forwards. And like, but well, how does it work? Your fresh new mind can make it work. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's such a great mindset. It's just it's yeah, incredible it's, how like 
two completely different ages that work so perfectly together. But it's not perfect, it's normal. We just, we've lost that. Um, throughout the years, we've just kind of, it's been developed that if you're a teacher and you're a student, you're looked at as the higher tier, the higher person. But I think that should be worked I was going to say earlier is that um, in, in a lot of schools, but in, in the education system in general, there's um, there's like an endless line of hierarchy between the you know you've got the the head and then you've got the million assistant heads, uh, deputy assistant heads, blah, blah, blah. and by the time all you need is got the head of education, and then by the time you've got to the school, then by the time you've got to the teacher pupil relationship, you've you've lost so much because you it's it's gone so far down. Um, I think that's what these smaller alternative schools, especially Sands, can really um, encourage is the focus is on two yeah. two types of people, you know, the teacher and the, and the pupil, and there's there's no um, there's not a million other hierarchies involved, which is so so vital in the education system, I believe, because yeah, otherwise by the time you get to that. By the time you get to the people who actually want to learn and need to learn, there's so much, yeah, so much to be lost. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So talking of um, hierarchies and authorities, as the facilitator, um, I want to give uh, Richard an opportunity to shoot his question because um, I see already it's 12 minutes past four and you guys have got useful work. Yeah. Um, uh, Richard, are you there? Already breaking. Why not Hello. Hey, do you wanna do you wanna quickly pop your question to these guys because they need to go off and poover the school carpet. <coughs> um, the same question as earlier. Already. Oh wait, I sorry. Uh, we did you and then Charles, didn't we? It's Momo. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Got next. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, man. Yeah. Cool. Did, were you happy with? Uh, yeah, very. Happy. You, Thank you very much for your. Uh, Okay, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so I'm breaking you in again. Uh, Momo, did you have a question you wanted to share? Uh, can you ask the one I posted to the Facebook event page? Whee! Uh, so, Momo, uh, st uh, let's refresh this. Greg, do you have a question you want to ask these guys? I think I got all my questions answered. Okay. Um, Momo says, I would love to ask the students the question. In what ways are you being the change you wish to see in the world? And how is your school helping you follow this? I feel for me, um, the, um, the ethics of democracy and, and being able to feel that, that my voice can be heard within the school and that I can make changes within the school has kind of given me the encouragement to now feel like I want to go out and make changes within the world. So it's kind of, um, for instance, in the, in the weekly school meeting, everyone is able to have a, uh, everyone's able to speak, and so you'll get 11 year olds debating with 60 year olds, and everyone's voice is equal. And um, because of that, being kind of thrown into that debating system for such a young age, I feel like I've um, grown to be like really. To kind of respect that I I want my voice to be heard and that's yeah that's inspired me to go on I now want to go on do politics at A level and want to be able to whatever I do make a change within the world so I think in, in that way although it doesn't um, although it doesn't directly um, yeah. directly make you a, um, Make you able to change things while you are at school. It kind of inspires you to yeah. go on. Yeah. Where it's like because it. I'm sorry, something. Um, like in a normal school, you like you don't get any voice in our country in any country really. To be 18, you're not allowed to vote. You don't have a choice in what happens with your life and in the country you live in. And actually, even on a smaller scale, but getting the choice and realizing that you can make a difference on how things run, even on a small scale, just mm. encourages that because by the time that people are 18 they just go, oh yeah, but I can't change things anyway, so why would I try? 
as opposed to actually feeling like you can and will make a difference. But I think because it encourages self-reflection and self yeah, you, you reflect on criticism. Yeah, so criticism, but yeah, um, but also the criticism and reflection of other behaviours and people around you. It encourages different perspectives and different decisions. Like even if it's something small, like I've turned pretty much turned vegan since being there. That's that's something that I would like to see in the world that's changed. And I would have never even considered it in my old school. Like you were saying, food is just so vile. I was just eating horrible meaty pizzas all the time. So you you wouldn't necessarily think about those kind of things and it's the small little reflections that make you change um, small things like your lifestyle which then in the bigger world can make a difference and also help you um, feel like because I think everyone has got a, uh, of course everyone's got a voice but I, I think everyone's got the ability to talk and, and articulate what they're thinking and feeling um, very well it's just not encouraged in a lot of environments and um, I think it sounds it is, and that, that that is a change that I think we all want to see is, is that people are hired um, yeah. wherever they're from. There was a student here left, a German student called Frieda, and she said, having been here for a year, what she realised was you have to also practice having an opinion. Mm -hmm. and it seemed like that should be natural to humanity, but if you're denied having an opinion, it changes the way you think, and I think what Esme is describing is also learning how to think all the way through thoughts and not to allow your addiction, your hunger, your selfishness to get in the way of thinking something through to the end. Yeah. So we sat and we talked about what's, what's the most evolved thing a human could do, and actually it seems the most evolved things we can do in one way is to move away from being hunter-gatherers and realise that we haven't the right to end something's life prematurely. And that's an end product. Most people stop at, well, I'm hungry and I like it. So it's about how we explore thinking. And I think that's what we do with smart change makers. Because it's about deep thinking and not lazy thinking, which is what happens when you're just regurgitating shit all day long. <laughs> well, good. Um, do we have time for the last question on the Facebook group? We can just get to it. Let's do it. We just have to do our stuff before we go home. Yeah, do it. Do and it. I'll, I'll help. I'll help one round and get whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last one we've got is probably the most, um, possibly the most challenging or like whatever. Um, Danny asks. Um, uh, it looks on Wikipedia like you have twenty teachers and sixty to eighty students. Do you think this would be massively impractical financially for most secondary schools, mm. as they often have well over a thousand students? True. Yeah. Well, Should we try and do a little bite rather than ramble? Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's something that I've thought about a lot actually is whether plants is sustainable and reproducible on a larger scale. I think it it is a challenge and I think there would definitely be things that would have to change because um, it's hard to, to learn it but it's so many people aren't used to this extreme style of education you could say it's not extreme at all but I mean in terms of what compared to, to regular education in, in the rest of the country um, I think there would be have they would have to be slowly incorporated into the system in various ways, whether it just be the, the loss of uniform or an improvement of food or something like that. But I think there would have to be slow changes that would be incorporated so there wasn't a, a system shock and that people could appreciate um, the small changes in the way forward. But yeah, I don't think it would be fair to say that we can just do all this on a large scale. I don't think that's necessary. I mean, I don't think it would be able but I, I think. On a larger scale, it would have to be slowly incorporated, just so people can get used to the idea. Because I do think it's very, it's very <coughs> considered a very absurd idea for a lot of people that that students um, get a say and that students are a uh, valid part of society and not just to get A's in these styles. And I think that a lot of teachers want that too. I think the, the direct teachers that are teaching these students don't want to be in the position that they're in. Yeah. So, yeah. The question is, is this you can't reproduce it and it's sort of privileged because it has so many others for a yeah. child? Well, 
whether it works um, on an economic level, just as this school does, probably not. But the point is, you don't need to copy and paste SANS and have the, like, because I'd say SANS is a fairly, in its ideology of how it works, you could say it's, well, compared to the norm, it's definitely fairly extreme. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to copy and paste how SANS works and do it for every school. Yeah. But what you can do is you can take the norm, which, is a, which in its own way is an extreme, yeah. and make the norm slightly closer to how SANS is in certain ways. Yeah. But it does not need to um, be exactly like SANS. I mean, I mean, maybe it could be, but that's not a question that... I think off the top of my head right now, you know, would be easy to answer. No. But, you know, one step to a certain direction would be better than no steps at all. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so for me, one of the ways we can think about it is if we do what we do, which is every teacher is on the same pay scale, and we're all on £27,000 a year before tax, you would change the economy of the school. When you have hundred and fifty thousand pound heads and heads of departments and sixty, seventy thousand if people took care of their own space like we do, so we don't employ we do employ a cleaner but it's about five hours a week. We look after the space, we cook for ourselves. There's economies that you can build in. That's really important. And also one of the reasons we've got loads of adults is actually because we do take on board children who have particular needs. And some so some of those adults are looking after people one to one. And that's really important we do it. But if you remove those from the equation not remove the kids, but look at most of the adults are teaching 70 to 80 kids a day. And that's not very dissimilar to a teacher in a state school. So there's, there's a way of looking at it which sounds like it is more multipliable up. Yeah. Um, but also the fact that schools are so big, I mean, it kind of, if you're in a state school which has two and a half thousand kids, you, a single child doesn't matter anymore. And actually I feel like that's something that we generally should be trying to get away from anyway, because we want, a, because every individual is worth recognizing, but if you're in such a massive school, you just get lost. So actually I feel like even working towards simply a smaller school where people were able to look at the individual and therefore actually look more closely at their individual needs would also already make a big difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think, think um, sorry. I think in a way SANS is able to function because it's a small part of the, um, uh, it feels like because it's small, you're able to have a strong relationship with the other students and with your teachers and there's that familiarity which is I can imagine really hard to get in a bigger environment um, and it's because of that um, familiar environment that you can then respect each other and listen to each other's opinions and really see each other as people instead of just another another set of grades um, so I think it would be really tricky to kind of um, to fully embody Sands's um, ethos for for state schools to embody that with the size that they are at the moment. And I think um, I think that this um, school I think I don't think it does work for everyone, which is why I think that small. Um, small changes are the way forward because I think there's the obvious things that work for everyone are things like food and their uniform and things that most people would massively benefit from and smaller schools because that is clearly that yeah like Sonia said that clearly produces better relationships and uh, more people to be heard uh, yeah. Wicked. Oh, I think we better wrap it up there, huh? Um, I'm just curious, really quickly. Sean was touching on how you guys clean the school as part of useful work. Do you want to just quickly say, like, which, what your areas are? What are you going to clean right now? I'm going to go and clean the art room. I'm the mom of the boss, <laughs> and, um, and yeah. she commands her army of ten useful workers to yeah, clean so the, all the, the people room around the daily. <laughs>
Okay, so you have area leaders now. Yeah. So do you still have a useful work committee going around with yes. the... Okay, so that's you. And you? Okay. <laughs> what are you cleaning? Uh, hoovering the stairs. I am doing the music room or somewhere upstairs. Brilliant, okay. Yeah. So these are going to be the messiest rooms, thanks for me. Um, <laughs> hey. All right, cool. I think that's everything. Thank you, Richard and Momo, and thank you so much, you guys, for, for that as well. And um, that will be on YouTube now, I guess. Cool, I'm going to go and help these guys as much as I can in the last few minutes. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.